Welcome to Love, Laughter, and Limits. I'm Tom Dozier, and this lesson is Feelings, Emotions, and Reflexes, Behavior Science, Part 2. This class will help you understand the basics of human behavior and why children do the things that they do. In this lesson, we're going to look at a form of behavior that's often not thought of as behavior at all, but it really is. You see, there's two types of behavior, and in part one, we talked about operant behavior, experience that works. Oper it's called operant because it operates on the world around us and produces some kind of result. These are learned behaviors that we learn from our experience and we learn what works for us. And it's virtually everything we do that we think of as behavior. But there's a whole other class of behavior that's called respondent behavior. And this is our reflexes, our physiological reactions, and our feelings and emotions. And these really are behaviors. Now, if we look at infant behavior, what can an infant do when he is born? Uh, an infant has a set of reflexes. These are behaviors that are just automatically, they're hardwired to, into us. And two of those cute little reactions that are very important for an infant is the rooting reflex and the sucking reflex. Now, the rooting reflex is where the infant's face is touched or the corner of the mouth, and the infant will turn. Why? Well, because that's the way it's going to find uh, the, the nipple to get milk. And then the sucking reflex, it's a way of getting nourishment in his body. These are very important reflexes and they die away. But there are other reflexes that an infant has that are maintained throughout their life and we still have them. The blink reflex is one of those. If there's a loud noise, uh, we'll blink. If something comes at our face, we'll blink. <clears throat> there are also invisible reflexes going on all the time. Our whole digestive system is a reflex reaction. Breathing uh, is often, we can think and breathe, but it's also a reflex reaction. And feelings are reflex reactions also. Feelings of stress and fear, happy and excited, uh, are all chemical physiological reactions in our bodies at the same time. You see, when we feel stressed, we're having cortisol hormones produced. When we feel happy, we're having endorphins in our body produced. Uh, things happen to get us agitated and upset. Our blood pressure is going up. Our heart rate's going up. These hormones are being produced. And all of these internal reactions are automatic reactions that we call feelings and emotions. We also have automatic reactions and automatic response to the world around us, to the stimulation of that world, which we get through our five senses through touch and smell and taste and sight and hearing, we get this sensation and it causes reactions. If we look at learning feelings uh, and the way we feel about certain things, uh, feelings are learned through what we call paired stimulus. And this is where something we have an experience uh, the stimulus, the sight, the taste, the smell, uh, something from our senses is experienced at the same time we get this physiological automatic reflex, then the two become paired together. So uh, oh, this is known generally as classical conditioning. And there's a very famous uh, story called Pavlov's dog, which is where this was first discovered, where Pavlov was a research uh, physician and he was studying digestion and specifically salivation and he was using these dogs and measuring the amount of saliva that they produced when they were fed certain things or certain amounts. And uh, what Pavlov found is that his experiment became messed up because when he came in to feed, give the dog the food before they ever got the food, which it was a food saliva experiment, uh, they started producing the saliva. And the reason for that was that there had been a pairing between uh, Pavlov's appearance and the food and the automatic reactions that the food produced. And so that when the dog saw Pavlov, their body started automatically producing uh, this reflex reaction, this respondent behavior of producing the saliva. 
So feelings are learned by this pairing. So a, a baby sees a puppy and they touch the puppy and the puppy's licking them and they're having this positive association between this fuzzy, warm, nice little puppy and the feelings that are associated with it. So when they see a puppy, they like puppies. But aversive pairings, all feelings also happen. Uh, let's take the puppy instance. The, the baby or the young child sees the puppy. They reach out for the puppy, and instead of having this warm, fuzzy little thing to interact with and getting those positive sensations, uh, the puppy bites the child. Now, there's a puppy and the sensation of pain and fear and all of these physiological reactions. So now the child sees the puppy and all of a sudden he starts to cry. And he's crying because he's experiencing this automatic reflex reaction, this respondent behavior, which is associated with the puppy. Now we've, that's a feelings and association, but we also often look at feelings and behavior. And which causes which? Do feelings cause behavior or is it the other way around? Well, this is the old chicken and the eggs question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? So which comes first, the feelings or the behavior? And what the research shows us is that it really is a behavior feeling relationship. So the behavior comes first, it produces feelings. Now, those feelings are now associated with the behavior, so they kind of wrap around so that it looks like feeling behavior. But it was learned through behavior first and then the feeling. So positive be payoffs associated with the behavior produce the positive feelings about the behavior. And just the opposite, aversive feelings, uh, unpleasant uh, aversive consequences associated with the behavior produce the unpleasant feelings about the behavior. So on the positive side, let's look at an example of that. I had a mom who had a nine-year-old, this mom was a science teacher, and she said that she wanted her nine-year-old to do his homework just because he wanted to learn. And I said, mm, you know, I don't think any nine-year-old does that. And very emphatically she says, I did. And she was very emphatic. And I said, okay, Play along with me for a second. Think back. When you were nine, was there anyone in your life who valued an education? And very quickly she says, oh, my dad did. And she made just a little pause and then said, and I would do anything to please my dad. Well, there was a the connection. You see, doing homework had been paired with daddy. And with all these positive interactions with daddy, and he would say, oh, what you doing, honey? Oh, the, how interesting. What did you learn at school today? How wonderful. And he's had all these positive interactions associated with learning and doing homework. And she thought she just liked to learn, that it was an automatic thing. But you see, there was this pairing of good feelings with all the kind of behaviors associated with learning. Now, if we look at the aversive consequence and negative feelings, uh, parents can often go, you know, have trouble with their kids with something like cleaning their room. And so you ask your child to clean their room, they don't start, and you start bugging them and nagging them, and you start scolding them, and you start yelling at them, and you have these, the child is experiencing these very negative reflex feelings, and it's associated with you and cleaning the room and clean rooms. And so a child can actually uh, come to react when you say clean your room and the child goes, oh, why are you always bugging me? And it's because they're having these negative feelings that have been paired, been learned and paired through these aversive interactions. Uh, an area where homework, where parents can easily get into trouble if you care is in homework checking. The child does the homework and then you check the homework. And then because you're a caring parent, you want to make sure that they get them all right, you say, oh, well, you still need to go back and fix three, seven, nine, and 15. You got them wrong. And the child goes, ah, oh, criticism. 
and the child is having this disappointment and they're feeling like and you're not trying to criticize them, but it's still correction and still criticism. Uh, and they're having these negative feelings associated with doing homework. They do their, their homework and you say, that's so messy. There's no way your teacher's going to be able to read that. Once again, they're doing homework, negative feelings associated with doing homework. So the child is starting to do their homework and they're having all these, this respondent, physical, physiological, internal reactions, these negative reactions going off in their bodies about doing the homework because once they get their homework done, then something unpleasant, you're going to check their homework, is going to happen. Now the lesson to take away from this is if something is important to you as a parent, then you want to have many positive interactions with the child with respect to that thing that's important, whether it be learning or going to church or being nice to other people or you know, being outgoing and talking to others or sharing. Whatever it is, you want to have positive actions, positive interactions associated with that and minimize the negative and unpleasant interactions. So, as, we've, as I've said, feelings are caused by behavior. Bad behavior produces bad feelings, which then appear to be causing the bad behavior. So if you're fighting with a child and screaming at them, then the bad feelings that the child is having are being paired with you, the parent, the task that's at hand, whatever the behavior needs to be, and the location, the part of the house, wherever it is that's, that's going on. So uh, these things, are, you can't stop these from happening. This is a respondent automatic reaction. If a child is tantruming for candy, they may get the candy and they may be happy that they got the candy, but there still have been a lot of bad feelings associated with what it took to get that candy. <clears throat> Maybe the child won't get ready in the morning. Once again, you're having these aversive, conflict-driven interactions, and all these bad feelings are being produced about needing to get ready and go to school and you as mom and dad and even waking up in the morning. I had a mom, I was a grandmom with a five-year-old grandson who had a lot of behavior problems, and his parents had used the analogy of going uphill, meaning good behavior, and going downhill meaning throwing fits, tantrums, and all kinds of bad behavior. And uh, Grandma said, so Tyler, do you feel better when you're going uphill or going downhill? He said, oh, Grandma, I feel much better when I'm going uphill. Yeah, but he didn't go uphill very often. And the problem is that a child may know that I feel better when I'm doing good things, but the payoff of the bad behavior kept the bad behavior happening. And so we need to be careful and we need to look at this and not just work on the feelings. You see, to improve the feelings, first improve the behavior. If you improve the behavior, then you're having positive interactions associated with appropriate behavior and that's going to improve the feelings. Another thing that happens is there are natural payoffs, uh, accomplishment and competence the child knows when they've done something well, and they're going to feel good that they've accomplished it, that they've mastered the task, that they can tie their own shoe, that they can make their bed, or they can help you uh, carry the table outside. My grandson, who's uh, 29 months old, helped me carry the table out yesterday, and he was so happy to be a helper. Well, there were lots of positive feelings uh, based on what Grandpa was saying, but also, he was actually doing something. There was a huge study, enormous study, took from 1968 to 1977, done by the federal government in studying, a, studying school curriculums. And there were three basic kinds of school curriculums. There was the basic skills, there was concepts and thinking, and then there was feelings and self-esteem. And these programs were evaluated by testing the students after they had been through these uh, years, several years of these classes. And what they found was that uh, the program that worked on feelings and self-esteem actually caused a significant decrease in the self-esteem of the children. 
and the program that worked on basic skills ac accomplished both a very sharp, high significant increase in the reading, writing, and math skills of the child, but also a significantly positive increase in the self-esteem of the children. You see, those children were working and accomplishing and doing and seeing positive connections between studying and mastery, and they felt good about it. So really, self-esteem, which has to do with feelings, uh, had a lot to do with accomplishing uh, basic tasks and getting the positive payoff. So it was behavior and increased self-esteem and feelings. Now we, we want to have a strong, close relationship with our children. This is so important. And that's why this program is called Love, Laughter, and Limits. Right? We know we want that strong feeling. And when our children are having emotions, to help maintain that closeness, we need to respond to those emotions with empathy and understanding and caring. We need to recognize that those emotional reactions are respondent behaviors and it's not really a choice at that moment. Once they start having it, it's a feeling. Respond to those feelings with empathy and caring. We'll have a whole lesson on that. We want to have lots of positive interactions. Enjoy our child and have them enjoy us. And these produce feelings of closeness and connection. And for many reasons, as we've talked about here, good behavior produces good feelings. So we want our children to behave well so they can have those good feelings that are associated with good behavior. Well, Love, Laughter, and Limits is here to teach you the positive parenting skills to help you do these things, to help you succeed in having a warm, positive relationship with your child and a child who behaves reasonably well. So thank you for watching Feelings, Emotions, and Reflexes, Behavior Science, Part 2. I'm Tom Dozier, wishing you an abundance of love and laughter in your family, along with limits to help your children behave well and be happy. Thank you.